Hello there, thank you for passing through the channel and checking out this video. I recorded this yesterday and for some reason my camera got all screwed up when I was recording it and so it's really really dark for some reason so I wanted to just kind of record this and kind of give you the heads up that it's a weird recording but I did put a lot into this video. This is an important topic and I think that I needed to do it justice by providing a lot of evidence around it so that people could really understand where we're at with this. So I did it a little bit different than other videos that I typically do. I did it with a PowerPoint presentation. So this video has accompanying slides and a super dark video of me, which is really, really weird. And I do apologize for that. I don't know what happened. Uh, but anyways, if you are new to the channel, be sure to like and subscribe. Uh, leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. Uh, always love to get involved in the conversation. So without further ado, enjoy this strangely dark video. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ask Concussion Doc. This episode is all about CTE, chronic neurodegenerative conditions associated with concussion. The title of this talk is How Worried Should You Be About the Long-Term Effects of Concussion? So maybe you've had one concussion, maybe you've had a couple concussions, maybe you have a history of playing contact sports and you're really, really concerned about what this has done to your brain in the long term. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through all of the research in this area, talk about what we know, talk about what we don't know, and all of the kind of question marks that still surround this topic. This is somewhat of a touchy uh, topic because there are many people that feel that these changes have happened to themselves and or a loved one. What I'm talking about here is purely based on the scientific evidence that we have at this point in time. So try not to get triggered by this particular topic. Try to just take the bulk of the evidence and understand where we are at at this point in time. Now I'm not advocating one side or the other, and what I'm, I'm going to try and break down is, like I said, just using the scientific evidence. So I hope this helps people to maybe ease some of your concerns around CTE um, and, and kind of look at things with a little bit more of, of a lens of scientific research versus the media narrative about this particular topic. Because the two things are actually quite different. So let's first talk about the media story around concussion and then we'll talk about the research and you guys can kind of put that together. Now this is going to be a pretty deep topic. I have a bunch of slides that I've prepared to go through on this subject. I also have Instagram live going here. So if you guys have questions as I go, obviously you won't be able to see my slides as I go through this, but feel free to ask me questions as I do this because then I think we can have a bit of a discussion at the end of this topic. So I might actually run out of time on the Instagram live uh, because I did put a lot into this because I wanted to kind of do it justice and cover it in this way. So this is, I think, going to be a pretty interesting one, probably going to challenge some of the conventional beliefs that are held about this particular topic um, and may, you know, upset some people with me. But like I said, I'm just trying to come at this from a point of view of what do we actually know and where are the question marks that still remain. So let's talk about media sensationalism, right? The media and the news organizations often get the story wrong. We've seen this with a number of things, especially in recent memory, where the scientific literature is not portrayed accurately by news outlets. They tend to portray one side of the story, and it tends to take on the narrative of fear, right? The business model of media is fear gets attention and clicks and reads. People are more likely to click on something that has a fearful connotation to it, something that is imminently threatening to them as an individual or someone they know or loved ones, they're more likely to click on that, engage with that, read that because we are more fear driven. Business model of media is fear driven, click based things. The more clicks they get, the more ad space they can sell, the more attention they grab, the more ad space they can sell. So this is why a lot of our news media centers around negative stories, fearful stories and fearful narratives. So we have to keep this in mind when we think about concussion and what we're actually hearing in the media. Is this fact or is this a narrative around a fear based model? 
And so I'm showing on my screen now for those watching on YouTube, a number of different news, you know, articles and sensational headlines that you see around concussion. There's one here that says, this is your brain on football. Uh, Eric Lindros, the untold concussion story. We have a movie that's been dedicated to concussion. And I have another headline here that was published on CNN a few years ago. And the headline is CTE found in 99% of studied brains of deceased NFL players, right? Now, if you've had a con couple concussions in your life, or God forbid you were a football player, how is that headline going to make you feel? You are likely going to read that, or you may ignore it, but see the headline and start to feel anxiety around this particular condition and start to think that you too may be the victim of this particular condition. So the question is, how does that make you feel, right? It gives you that fear response, likely if you've had any impact around concussion. Now, there was a study that was done just this past year and looking at how um, um, universities and academic institutions publish press releases around their research. And those press releases are what the media takes and uses to publish stories. And so the press release coming out, if it has, you know, a sensationalistic viewpoint, the media is more likely to grab that. And again, academic institutions are likely to try and promote things that get published in the media because that increases funding rates, it gets more grant dollars, it, it increases donors from, from alumni of that institution. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why you would sensationalize the research that that's coming out the press releases around the research that that is being done and this particular study found there was a high degree of spin in recent press releases dedicated to concussion research the reports often overstated the strengths and practical impact of the study publicized substandard research without clinical relevance while downplaying or completely failing to report any limitations and caveats to the study misrepresentation in press releases can affect real life medical decisions and outcomes and the reason why it can affect real medical decisions and outcomes is because it's not only the public that's reading media articles and assuming that what they're reading is factual, but also healthcare providers are reading media uh, documentation as well, right? Healthcare providers, especially if you're a family physician, you're dealing with a thousand different, you know, a million different things that you have to try and uh, keep under, you know, wraps. And so you can't read the research. You can't do a deep dive into the concussion literature to help your patient understand that, yeah, it's really not as sensational as you're reading in the media. And so what you get is medical professionals starting to think the same thing that the media is portraying. Now, here is a really good um, quote that came from an article that was, that was published a few years ago. And I will just read this out because I think this makes so much sense. The problem is further compounded by the fact that providers, meaning healthcare providers, are subject to the same media sensationalism surrounding CTE. And few are positioned to take on the sort of rigorous review and analysis of the CTE literature presented here. Hence, providers across settings like emergency rooms, primary care clinics, mental health clinics are likely to be unprepared to provide the very education required to ameliorate anxiety born of media hyperbole and thereby to inadvertently collude with patients and perpetuate the very anxiety that's driving their symptoms. The fact that education is among the best evidence-based interventions for preventing poor outcomes after mild traumatic brain injury makes this situation untenable and illustrates the vital importance of correcting misunderstanding regarding TBI and CTE among public and health professionals. And that is what I'm going to try and do to this. So here we go. This right here that I'm looking at on my screen is what's called the evidence pyramid. So if you look at a uh, the quality of scientific evidence, there is a pyramid. There is a hierarchy of what constitutes good, strong evidence and what constitutes low quality or preliminary evidence. At the very bottom, you have expert opinion. You know, kind of just, we don't really know, we've never studied it, but based on what I know about 
uh, X, I can assume that the same is likely to be true of Y. So I may infer this because I'm an expert in the area. I start to kind of take what I know about it and kind of make predictions as to what I think is going to be associated with a completely separate condition or something along the same lines, but not quite the same. So you have expert opinion. That's the lowest form of evidence. It's just something we think. And oftentimes when we do studies on things that we think are going to happen, it turns out to be not accurate, right? So this is why research is so important. The next one up from that is case series or case reports where you take an individual person or series of people, let's say you take 10, 15, 20 people and you don't have any control groups, but you run you know, a particular treatment outcome on them and they feel better. So you, you make the conclusion that my treatment works. But because you didn't have any type of control group, you don't know if what they were going through was a placebo. You don't know all of the variables that may have been thrown into the mix because you have nothing to compare to. So that's why this is a low form of evidence. Next up, you have case control studies, which you have cases, but you also include some control elements to it. You have cohort studies, which looks at a large group of people over time to say, well, these people are similar in this way. Let's see how this plays out. So it's more observational. Then you have randomized control trials where you actually take people, you randomly put them into groups and you study specific outcomes. This controls for things you may not even be aware that are going on under the surface. So that's why it's a higher form of evidence. Then finally, you get into systematic reviews, meta-analysis, which are combinations of all of the previous studies that have been done and they bring everything together onto, into one kind of umbrella to say this is what we know overall. Now what we're dealing with with the CTE literature is literally just case series and some kind of uh, observational cohorts of like large data sets. So we're literally dealing with a very, very low form of evidence. This is what we would call preliminary evidence in general. So we're at a very, very low form of evidence, but yet the media doesn't present it like this. They present it like fact as if we were to have meta-analysis and systematic reviews that are actually saying that this is the case. But actually we're dealing with a very, very preliminary uh, form of evidence. Now the problem with the the whole CTE narrative other than the media kind of narrative around it and the kind of misleading coverage is we have some issues with how these studies are done because of just the sheer nature of trying to figure out what has caused a particular thing. A lot of things happen in life and there are limitations to the studies we currently have. So number one we have sample biases. The we don't have any control brains. So typically the, the people that are donating their brains are former football players, former boxers, military veterans, um, you know, hockey players, people that have played a lot of contact sports. So you're getting a lot of people of simil similar demographic background um, that are having cognitive problems that, and that we don't really have any control brains. So you're getting a lot of, a lot of donation of brains from people that are in a particular demographic, not as much from any other demographics to be able to be used as a comparison. So we have a limitation because the sample is inherently different than what we'd expect in the general population. So we're dealing with what's called sample biases. Even if we look to the headline that I showed earlier where it said CTE was found in 99% of studied brains of NFL players players because not every NFL player donates their brains. The people that donated their brains were people that were having issues. Well, there could be all sorts of different neurodegenerative conditions in and amongst those brains because of people just being people and having, you know, these types of conditions that happen. So 99% of the studied brains, but you have thousands of others that weren't studied. So you really have no idea what the actual prevalence of this is. But 99% sounds like a lot, doesn't it? But that is an inherent sample bias problem. Um, this study also had a bunch of other flaws that we're going to talk about kind of, you know, next. So number two, we're typically relying on self-reported concussion histories. We know that people are not very good at remembering the accurate number of concussions that they've had. Recent studies have found that actually former NFL players, former college football players are very inaccurate at telling how many concussions they've had. They're likely to overestimate their concussions if they have cognitive problems. So if you're running a survey that says, hey, are you having cognitive problems? Those that report yes will actually report higher number of concussions than they've actually had. So you end up with this strong association based on number of concussions and cognitive problems self-reported because simply the people that report more concussions tend to over-report their concussions to a higher degree. 
So you end up with this problem that we think that concussions are associated with cognitive impairment, self-reported, but we're actually not getting the accurate number of concussions. And so relying on self-reported history is actually just an inherent flaw of much of this research. Third, pathology does not equal symptoms. We have had brains where people have had no symptoms in life. So somebody has donated their brain somewhat as a control saying, I played football, but I don't have any headaches. I don't have any symptoms after, but here's my brain anyway. And they take a look at it and then they find CTE. So if the pathology of CTE, meaning the little findings they find inside the brain, the tau pathology that's inside the brain, if that is the cause of symptoms, how come they can have this particular thing and not have symptoms? So that's question one. Secondly, we have other people that have a ton of symptoms and think that they have CTE, donate their brains, they look at the brain, no CTE, so no pathology. So there's a disconnect between the symptoms and the actual pathology that we find in some of these brains. So it calls into question, what is driving the symptoms? If it's the pathology, how come we're not seeing it in everyone? And if it's not the pathology, why is that pathology there? And does it have anything to do with the symptoms that we experience? So that is question three. Question number four, the symptoms that people describe overlap with a number of other conditions. The symptoms of CTE can look like a ton of different things. Anxiety, depression, mental health disorders, just chronic headaches, chronic fatigue, um, you know, emotional conditions, all sorts of different things, CTE kind of fits in that diagnostic criteria. So if you're a former football player and now you're depressed, you can actually meet the diagnostic criteria of CTE or suspected CTE. And telling somebody that they have this condition could further their depression and make things worse, right? This is why CTE can only be diagnosed post-mortem. We have no way of diagnosing this right now in life. But yet I still have people telling me that they or their spouse has been diagnosed with CTE and they're alive. Well, that is actually not possible. You can suspect it. You can have a clinical suspicion of it, but you can't formally diagnose it until after death. Number five, other things can cause the same type of tau protein deposition. There's more than 20 different what's called tauopathies. Tauopathies are conditions which cause tau protein to be developed and, and deposited in the brain. Alzheimer's is a tauopathy. CTE is a tauopathy. CTE and Alzheimer's actually have different patterning. So they look different on pathological examination. Alzheimer's tends to be more widely distributed. CTE tends to be located in areas that are close to the cortex and around small blood vessels. Okay, so that's the difference between, it's just the patterning of where these are. Now, this was expected or, or thought to be a distinct feature of CTE. But actually, there's a few conditions. One of them is called RTAG, which is age-related tau astrogliopathy. And then there's another one called PART. I can't remember what the acronym stands for at this, at this moment. But they have the same patterning of tau protein deposition as CTE. But it's not related to head trauma at all. It's just simply age-related. And so if we have these conditions, we have to figure out how many of these people just have these conditions that are completely age-related that we're attributing to head injury. Meanwhile, it might just be the fact that they're, they have these conditions that are age-related, okay? So we have to kind of keep this stuff in mind. Other things that can cause tau protein deposition, opioid medications, increased body mass, obesity, high blood pressure, and a, uh, and a bunch of different things, chronic inflammation, chronic sleep uh, uh, deficiencies can also lead to cognitive impairments that go along with CTE or anything else, just age-related dementia changes. So here's what we know, here's what we don't know. So what we do know at this point in time is that it appears that some former athletes, when they die, have tau protein deposits in their brain. We also know that some former athletes complain of cognitive impairment later in life. So we should take this seriously. We should look at this and let's dive in to the research on this. Here's what we don't know. Why, why is that tau protein there? It's thought to be head trauma, but we actually don't have any conclusive proof that it is. It could be a variety of different things, as we'll discuss. How prevalent is this in the general population? Like I said, there are certain tauopathies that happen as, as not a result of head injury. So how do we know that these athletes aren't just displaying something that's part of normal life for a variety of different people? Um, and then do these deposits actually cause the symptoms that people experience in life? So far, we haven't been able to strongly associate that. 
what else could be driving depression? What else could be just driving suicide? What else could be driving cognitive deficits? So these are the questions we don't know, and let's dive in on this. So here's a big study that was done in Denmark. They had 2.7 million people for a total of 27 million people years. So they basically followed these 2.7 million people over a period of 10 years. And they were looking at those that came in with a history of traumatic brain injury of all severities. So if you have a hospital diagnosed record of traumatic brain injury of mild, moderate, or severe, remember concussion is mild, and then you have moderate and severe. And then they looked at how likely were they to develop a diagnosis subsequently of dementia. And then they looked at the association between that to try and see, does brain injury predict dementia diagnosis? All right. So here's the study. And what they found was the fully adjusted risk of all cause dementia in people with a history of traumatic brain injury was higher than those without a history of traumatic brain injury, uh, as was the specific risk of Alzheimer's disease. So they did find an association, traumatic brain injury leading to increased risk of dementia. Okay. Large population based study. And this is what we find. So that's one point for the brain injury causes dementia uh, category. Some things to keep in mind here. This was most significant in the moderate and severe brain injury category. The mild brain injury category had a small association, slightly increased risk. So not necessarily sure if we can say that like for sure there's a risk, but small risk in those with mild. The big association was in severe brain injuries. This study was also was prospective in nature, which is good. It was it was well designed in that way, but it's just looking at hospital based records. So brain injuries that come into hospitals versus those that go into, let's say, a primary care clinic are likely to be more severe in nature and likely to have more comorbidities and be associated with potentially polytrauma. So car accident victims, these people that have a multitude of injuries may be happening simultaneously along with that. So we have to just keep that in mind that this may not be generalizable to you know, the average person who, who bumped their head or slipped and fell, right? If they haven't gone to the hospital necessarily. So it does create a bit of a generalizability problem. Next up, there's a study looking at cognitive decline after moderate and severe brain injury. So this was a smaller study. We had only 53 individuals. So that's a limitation of this study. And they had moderate to severe brain injury. So more significant than concussion. And they had 26 controls and they studied them prospectively to see who would develop um, cognitive decline. And what they found was individuals with traumatic brain injury did not show a significantly greater decline in neuropsychological performance uh, over time compared with demographically similar controls. There was no association between change over time with IQ, time since injury, or injury severity. Being older at injury time did have greater adverse events, and you'll see that throughout the studies. Those that get their concussions later in life, particularly um, you know, like elderly individuals, tend to have cognitive impairments that do come on kind of stronger than if you get it when you're younger. So this one found no association between moderate and severe brain injury and any type of cognitive impairment. So no association. Smaller study though. Next study here looking at soccer players, former professional soccer players. They looked at people that played soccer between uh, January 1st, 1900 and January 1st, 1977. And then they compared them with 23,000 people of the general population. And they looked at their hospital records between 1981 to 2016 to see how many of those people that played soccer during that span came in with um, dementia and neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, later in life. And so they had 7,600 male former professional soccer players compared to 23,000 members of the general public. And what they found was there was an increased risk of neurodegenerative disease among soccer players versus the healthy controls. So they did find increased risk. Regarding career length, risk was highest among former professional soccer players with career lengths lasting longer than 15 years. So the association was the longer you played soccer, the more likely you had risk of neurodegenerative disease. Now, they're attributing this to head trauma, but what else could happen over a career of playing professional sports, right? You could have, um, 
you know, increased drug and alcohol abuse. You could have, um, you know, just the sheer volume of physical exertion and just like exercising to such a significant degree. What does that do? Does that create any type of impairment? Almost over exercising? We don't know. Um, it could be, you know, the, the diet that people are taking, the supplements people are taking, the um, stress that you may be under while playing. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different reasons that can happen or things that can happen over somebody's life that we have to take into consideration. So what we have here is we set length of career playing soccer is associated with increased risk of neurodegenerative disease. We don't know what in the game of soccer led to that particular finding. We don't know. All we know is soccer and this. Okay. So we don't have any necessarily correlation there and head trauma being an inciting thing. And then we have this other study here looking at rugby players. So this study looking at rugby players, a uh, total of 146 participants were recruited. Uh, mean playing career length was 15 years. A total of 80% reported rugby-related concussions. So 80% of the sample reported rugby-related concussions. And they found no association between concussion and uh, the preclinical Alzheimer's cognitive composite, so no cognitive decline. Overall, there was no association between concussion and cognitive function. However, they did find an association with age. So again, there's some age-related things here. So the older you are, potentially there is more of an issue. Next up, we have a study that was done in 2005, but this is an important one. And so this is a survey that was sent out to former NFL players, and they asked them about their concussion history, but also their cognitive impairment. They were looking for players that were diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. Retired players with three or more concussions had a five-fold pre five prevalence of mild cognitive impairment diagnosis and a three-fold prevalence of significant memory problems compared with retirees without a history of concussion. Here's the limitations. Number of concussions is self-reported. We know that players are not good at remembering how many concussions they've had. Secondly, um, these, these other things, reporting significant memory problems. Like I said, you're just self-reporting this. And oftentimes what you'll see in some studies that are coming up is that those that report significant memory problems, when you actually study them, a lot of them don't actually have memory problems. So it's self-reported. They feel that they have memory problems, but they actually do not. Now, secondly, when you look at this sample versus the general population, overall, Alzheimer's disease diagnosed in this sample was 1.3%. So 1.3% of this particular sample had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. In the general U.S. population of the same age, 11% of the population has Alzheimer's disease diagnosed. So based on this, you're actually less likely to have Alzheimer's if you've played in the National Football League. Secondly, in this population, only 2.9% reported that they had had a history of mild cognitive impairment or a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment. In the general U.S. population, mild cognitive impairment diagnosis ranges between 5 and 30 percent. So again, less likely to have mild cognitive impairment in former NFL players than the general population. Same thing with depression. So they found that 11 percent of respondents in this particular study, former NFL players, reported having a history of prior or previous or current uh, diagnosis of depression. So 11%. In the general U.S. population, the number is 16.5%. So again, you are less likely to have prior or current depression if you played in the NFL, which is counter to the narrative that you hear in the media. Here's a study looking at high school football play in the 1940s and 50s back when equipment wasn't as good and the rules were not favorable and there was no concussion protocols whatsoever, they compared people later in life uh, that lived in the same area, they compared people that played football between 1946 and 1956 to male members of the band, glee club, and choir, so non-contact sport, uh, non-contact people versus football players of the same school and the same district, how many developed neurodegenerative diseases, and they found no difference between the groups. Our findings suggest that high school students who played American football from 1946 to 56 did not have an increased risk of later de developing dementia, Parkinson's, ALS compared with non-football playing high school males despite poor equipment, less regard for concussions compared with today, and no rules prohibiting head-first tackling. So again, it's one of these things where we assume that people playing football are going to have long-term neurodegenerative consequences or you're worried that you've had a couple concussions in your life. 
and you think you're going to end up with long-term neurodegenerative conditions. These are people that played football for four years in high school, suffering countless hits to the head, countless concussions with no protocols in place whatsoever. And there's no difference in their risk of diagnosis for dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS across the board. Okay. This study here, Grant Iverson actually looked at people with no history of head trauma and no history of contact sport participation. So they did a neuropathological examination looking at brains of healthy, normal people that had no exposure to contact sports and no history of concussion whatsoever, no history of head trauma. And what they found was that 75% of them showed tau protein in their neurons, astrocytes, and cell processes around small blood vessels that basically would meet the diagnostic criteria for CTE. So if chronic traumatic encephalopathy is due to head trauma, then how come people with no head trauma have CTE in their brains. So we have to start thinking maybe it's not due to trauma. Maybe there's other factors at play. Another study here from this was just posted in the Toronto Star study on former NHL players and concussions yields surprising early results. Like I said, oftentimes people feel that they have cognitive impairment, but when you actually test them, they actually show no signs of cognitive impairment compared to people of the same age and gender and everything else. So here's a study. In a new study by Toronto researchers, ex-NHL players showed no significant cognitive impairment, regardless of how many concussions they'd suffered. But the findings don't match how some players say they feel. So again, you say you feel one way, but you think you have memory problems, you think you have cognitive problems. But in reality, when we test you, you're the same as everybody else. So what are we really going, what's really going on here? Is this a psychological manifestation of, you know, the media anxiety that's coming out, right? If you start seeing this stuff on the media, you start thinking like, oh my God, I have this. I had concussions. I had a lot of brain trauma, repetitive head trauma. So am I going to be like this? And you start to potentially start to feel like maybe things aren't quite right. And that can really, really be tricking. So we have to think about these things. Next up, obviously a super touchy subject around this, but suicide. Okay, concussions are associated with suicide. You see reports um, in in like Time Magazine, the most dangerous game, and it has a deflated football. There's there's this headline that says, "I will go to the grave believing that concussion killed my son." Then you have you know Steve Montador and all of these other ex NHL players and you know Junior Seau and committed suicide, and people are attributing this to concussions, repetitive head trauma, brain injury. Okay, but when you actually look at the literature, epidemiological evidence indicates that former NFL players are at lower, not higher, risk for suicide than the general population. So there is a protective effect for playing professional sports against suicide. So if head trauma, repetitive head trauma and brain injury increases your risk for suicide, why are we seeing lower suicide risk in former NFL and NHL players? than the general population, okay? In a study done of 10 people that committed suicide, six of the 10 actually didn't even have the pathological findings of CTE. So 60% of this particular sample didn't have CTE, but yet the thought was that CTE is what caused them to commit suicide. So if CTE caused them to commit suicide, how come there's no CTE findings in these brains, right? Suicide is very multifactorial. We can't necessarily attribute it to saying, oh, the tau protein did it. Okay, there's a variety of reasons that could be at play here, and I think we need to think about this in that way. There's a substantial link between suicide and factors experienced by suffering from a loss of identity, such as forced or early retirement. We see this in farmers. We see this in military vets, people that have this identity of like, I'm, a, I'm, I'm in the military, and then you're discharged. Well, what do you do now? If I'm not doing this, what am I doing now? Right? You have professional athletes that have played their whole, you know, junior, high school, uh, college, professional careers, and this is what they've done, and all of a sudden they're 30 years old, and it's over. What do you do now? Who are you now? Right? The loss of identity is associated with increased risk of depression, cognitive decline, and suicide. So how much of this is at play and not necessarily anything to do with head trauma, brain injury, but just the psychology of being forced out of your vocation, your job, and having really nothing to fall back on, loss of identity. That is a big 
thing. We see it across other spectrums. So we have to consider this in this particular field. Another study here, this study is titled Mortality from Mental Disorders and Suicide in Male Professional American Football and Soccer Players. This was a meta-analysis. And what they found was that former male NFL players had a lower risk of mortality from mental disorders and suicide than the general population. So this was another study that was done. This finding was also corroborated in male soccer players. So the narrative in the media is that concussions, brain trauma, CTE are leading to players to, cause, to commit suicide. But in reality, they're actually at lower risk for committing suicide than any member of the general population. Okay. Conclusions, participation in male, uh, of male athletes in American football or soccer at the professional level might confer a certain protective effect against mortality from mental disorders or suicide. So what does the evidence say? Where are we at? Well, it's mixed at best. We're all over the map. And these are cases looking at professional athletes that have spent their whole adult life getting in their early adult years getting hit in the head and concussed. And it's still not clear at, at that level. So if you're somebody that's had one or two concussions, are you worried or should you be worried? If you're somebody who's played professional sports, should you be worried? Well, it may not be so clear cut. And I'm not telling you completely not to be worried. And I think at the end here, we're going to talk about some things that can be done if you are worried. But I'm just thinking that we're not at the point yet where the media says we are. And I think a lot of people are falling into the trap thinking I am screwed when they really don't need to be thinking that way yet. They need to be going, okay, let's look at everything and realize that, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, a good chance that there's really nothing here, right? There may be, but there's a good chance that there's not. So what do we know? Well, some former athletes have tau protein deposits in their brains, but so do some people that have no history of concussion at all. So are concussions causing it? I think that fails to be seen. We also know that some former contact sport athletes report cognitive symptoms and impairments. However, many studies show no objective cognitive deficits. So do we actually have cognitive deficits? Well, so far, the evidence there is mixed too. So what could be driving the symptoms and the pathology that we're seeing? Well, there's a couple things. It could be concussions, could be head trauma, but it also could be related to a variety of other things. One of those is improper management. We've seen studies in both animals and humans that have found that it's not necessarily the number of concussions you get, but how close together they are. Now, we see in, in mice studies, so there's a study done by William Meehan where they gave uh, mice, they gave three groups of mice, each of them five concussions back to back. Group one got a concussion every day for five days. Group two got a concussion every week for five weeks. And group three got a concussion every month for five months. Now, in animals, in mice particularly, the recovery from concussion from a metabolic standpoint is a five-day recovery. So animals getting hit every day are getting hit before their recovery time point. Animals even getting hit every week are getting hit right on the cusp of their recovery time point. Animals getting hit every month, however, they're able to recover fully before the next concussion happens. And what they find is that those getting concussed every single day for five days are significantly impaired and those getting concussed every week for five weeks are somewhat impaired compared to sham groups or groups that have never had a concussion. But those animals getting concussed every month show no difference from a group that has never had a concussion before, but everybody got five concussions. So it's not necessarily the number of concussions you got, but it's how close together they were. Now, we see that same group a year later, the group that had a concussion every day for five days is still impaired. The group that got a concussion every month for five months is still not impaired. They're the same as a group that never had a concussion in terms of their cognitive function. So, again, is it improper management? Maybe in professional sports, it's not the fact that they've had a bunch of concussions, but it because, it's because they're putting them back on the field every week to keep playing in a game when they haven't fully recovered properly. So that's one thing to consider. Chronic persistent neuroinflammation, blood-brain barrier degradation, and all these other factors that come from uh, repetitive head trauma in a close proximity uh, time period. Next up, another thing that could be driving this, opioid medication, okay? Drug abuse. There's increased tau deposition in the brains of opioid 
drug uh, users over the age of 40 years. 52% of NFL players reported opioid use during their NFL careers. So half of players in the NFL use opiates when they're playing. 71% of those report themselves as abusers of opioid medication, right? Popping painkillers to stay on the field, stay in the game, get back in the game. Current opioid use among NFL retirees is three times higher than that of the general population. Now, if opioids lead to tau protein deposition and you have NFL players using opioids to a significant degree, how much is that causing what we're finding on the pathological examination? Not only that, but the symptoms of chronic opioid use can reflect that of concussion, depression, you know, all, you know, the rebound headaches, chronic pain, all these other factors that kind of go into this is associated with it. Opioid use is linked with similar symptoms to CTE, memory impairment, perception difficulties, altered psychomotor function. Here was a recent study that was just done this past year, co-use of opioids and sedatives among retired NFL uh, athletes. And what they found was Oftentimes, athletes are not only using opioids, but they're using them together with sedatives, which increases risk of overdose and, and other problems. But I just want to go through some of the stats here. 12% of this NFL sample reported heavy alcohol use in the past week. Participants sustained an average of eight concussions during their career, currently had moderate pain. Nearly half had moderate and severe physical health impairment, 22% had moderate severe mental health impairments, and approximately 9% had disability. Prevalence of any past 30-day opioid or sedative use was 16%, 8.4% respectively. So 16% of the sample had used opioids in the past 30 days, and 12% reported heavy alcohol use in the previous week. So there's substance abuse problems that may be at play as well that could be contributing to some of this. Next up, psychology and mental health, right? We noted that in this previous study, we found that in the sample, uh, 22% had moderate and severe mental health impairments. So this is just talking about how that kind of goes together. Now I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read this out because it's just it's a good, it's well done as it is. The clinical features attributed to CTE have been expanded greatly and include virtually any mental health or neurological symptom or problem present prior to death, such as one depression and anxiety. Two, suicidality. Three, personality changes, anger control problems and violence, poor financial decisions, financial problems, bankruptcy, marital problems, separation and divorce, headaches, generalized body aches and pains, insomnia, Parkinsonism, mild cognitive impairment, dementia, motor neuron disease resembling ALS, right? Although suicide is often reported to be a clinical feature of CTE in case studies and general review papers, several reviews focus specifically on suicide. One retrospective historical case review study and one epidemiological study have concluded that there is minimal to no scientific evidence to support this assertion. Further, a correlation between CTE pathology and depression has not been established. Moreover, in psychiatry, depression is conceptualized as heterogeneous, multifactorial in causation, and is believed to arise from the cumulative effect of genetics and a bunch of other things. Many of the clinical symptoms that have been attributed to CTE pathology are common in the general population. Depression, anxiety, anger, financial problems, marital problems, headaches, bodily pain, and insomnia. That happens throughout our population. Of these, depression is often ascribed to CTE pathology or that CTE pathology causes depression. Such an assertion could be considered a hypothesis to, to be tested, not an established clinical clinical pathological correlation or causal association. Therefore, former military, former athletes, military vet veterans, and civilians who have neuropathology characteristic of CTE might experience depression for a broad range of reasons, similar to people in the general population who have no history of athletic participation or military service. Simply put, if a former athlete developed depression in association with life stress, marital problems, and chronic pain, that person could be incorrectly assumed to be showing the clinical features of a progressive neurodegenerative disease, the diagnosis of which could further exacerbate this psychiatric condition. So these are things we have to keep in mind. Chronic inflammation is another potential driver of both the symptoms that people experience as well as the neuropathology that we see post-mortem. Alcohol use, obesity, high blood pressure, lack of exercise, sleep disturbances, all of these contribute to neuroinflammation, gut issues, and subsequent neuroinflammation. Inflammation is now thought to be kind of the leading thing behind neurodegenerative conditions. So it 
we should be considering the fact that concussions can drive neuroinflammation and all these other things can drive neuroinflammation. Concussion paired with all of these other things make even worse neuroinflammation. And then the neuroinflammation may be actually the cause of all the other factors that we see on the neuropathology and the symptoms that people experience, right? These things cause cognitive issues, depression, anxiety, and neurodegenerative conditions. Here's a quote looking at a recent study that was done just this month uh, in world neurosurgery. Older patients with hypertension displayed significantly higher cognitive impairment risk after even mild traumatic brain injury. For these patients, we should take carefully management even after mild traumatic brain injury. So hypertension and age were associated with cognitive decline more so than just concussion itself. This is a study, a series of studies that were done at the University of Buffalo a few years ago, and they were looking at early onset dementia, but also imaging findings. So here's the results. They compared former NFL and NHL players with non-contact sport athletes. I believe it was cyclists and swimmers. Um, yeah, it just says match non-contact patrol uh, control athletes. So what they found was former NFL and NHL athletes perceived themselves to have impaired executive function, but this was not confirmed by objective neurocognitive assessment. Again, they thought they had something wrong. Objective cognitive assessment finds no difference between them and non-contact athletes. No significant differences were found when comparing contact sport athletes with controls on the presence of mild cognitive impairment or brain structural and functional tissue injury. So they looked at fMRIs as well. Contact sport athletes were more anxious and we're more likely to report unusual beliefs and experiences. Conclusions. None of the retired contact sport athletes qualified as having early onset dementia consistent with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. There were no remarkable differences in imaging, cognition, behavior, or executive function from non-contact sport athletes. The results underscore an apparent disconnect between public perceptions and evidence-based conclusions about the inevitability of chronic traumatic encephalopathy and the potential neurodegenerative effect on former uh, athletes on contact sports. So here's some interesting findings. Eight to 18 of the 22 contact athletes reported sleep problems. Sleep causes neuroinflammation. Only one of the non-contact athletes had sleep problems. 16 of the 22 contact athletes also had had a previous surgery to other injuries due to another injury sustained while playing versus none of the non-contact sport athletes. Surgery, inflammation, pain, you know, abuse of substances, also inflammation. 19 of 22 contact athletes reported chronic pain that was confirmed on physical examination versus only one of the non-contact athletes. Non-contact athletes were almost twice as likely to participate in regular exercise versus the contact athletes. So you have contact athletes that are having sleep problems, previous surgeries, um, chronic pain, and they're not exercising. All of these things contribute to neuroinflammation, depression, weight gain, poor blood flow, poor cognition. And so is this concussion or is this lifestyle effects after, after playing sports? The quote here on the conclusion, these athletes, the athletes who are experiencing mild cognitive impairment may have more to worry about because of obesity, chronic pain, and sleep disturbances than they do with their history of playing a contact sport. And this study was just published March of this year, so 2022, literally this past week. Sleep quality, a common thread linking depression, post-traumatic stress, and post-concussion symptoms to biomarkers of neurodegeneration following traumatic brain injury. Conclusion, the congruency of associations raises the possibility of a common pathophysiological process underlying differing symptomatologies. Given its role in neurodegeneration and mood dysregulation, sleep physiology seems a likely candidate. So, sleep is impacted. Gut, diet, diet. Inflammation is impacted. Opioid medication is impacted. Mental health psychology is impacted. Possibly head trauma is a factor. Possibly genetics are a factor. So really what we're looking at here is potentially a multifactorial thing. We don't, we can't necessarily say that head trauma causes this, but it could be a factor at play. This is where we're at. We just don't know. So what we have here is a neurobiological perspective. We have a psychosocial perspective, and it comes together in neuropathology and clinical and functional outcomes, and everything's included in this. So I have a model in front of me here that says genetics, normal aging, 
exposure to anesthesia, which can do that as well. We have social withdrawal, retirement adjustments, financial status. It's not going to be helpful if you've lost all your money and now you're broke and uh, not able to, you know, uh, provide for yourself. And then you have psychiatric conditions, sleep disorders, chronic pain, neurodevelopmental issues. They don't have neuroinflammation in here, but basically all of this stuff feeds in to potentially create a clinical picture as well as a pathology pathological picture. And so the question is, at the start of this, how worried should you be about the long-term effects of concussions? Well, it kind of depends. We have some evidence that TBI, particularly more severe forms of TBI, is associated with mild cognitive impairment later in life. Uh, but it very kind of mixed at this point, right? We also have these studies looking at former NFL players and soccer players who've received hundreds and hundreds of hits um, every year, tons and tons of concussions. And we see that there's really no increased risk of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and other neurodegenerative conditions later in life. Now, some studies do show that, other studies don't. So it's mixed. So if you're somebody that's had a few concussions here and there throughout your life, I think your risk is next to zero. You shouldn't be concerned about this really at all. If we're having this difficult of a time finding an association in former NFL and NHL players that literally got banged up for years of their life, I don't think that you have to worry because you've had three concussions in your life. Like, don't even think about it for another second. Now, if you're a professional athlete or you played a lot of contact sports or you're a boxer or anything like that, military vet, whatever it is, and you had a lot of head trauma, a lot of impacts, then maybe there could be some risk to you. Okay, so you should, you know, maybe be a bit worried about it, but there's things you can do. Now, a lot of this is based on a theory called the accelerated decline hypothesis. Basically, over time, we cognitively decline as a result of age. The theory here is that getting concussions along the way increases so that normal trajectory is like this concussion trajectory is like this so you actually just hit your cognitive decline faster and sooner than you would if you were just normal healthy person okay so this is called the accelerated decline hypothesis now there's things you can do to mitigate this risk so if you are somebody who's in the camp of like i am concerned about this because i've had a ton of concussions and i played a lot of sports and i was a boxer or whatever it may be and I've maybe had substance abuse problems and all these other factors that may go into it. There's things you can do to limit your risk. And we're going to go into those right now. So number one, stay educated and informed. Please don't take everything you hear in the media as fact, because as soon as you do, they can convince you that something is wrong with you. And just the anxiety of that, you will start to pick up every little thing in your life and you'll find things wrong, right? You forgot where you put your keys. You're going to go, oh my God, my brain, I'm screwed. And you're going to immediately think that something is wrong with you, right? This is something that happens to everybody in everyday life. So don't attribute that necessarily to your concussion history. So take things with a grain of salt, okay? They are not concerned with science. They are concerned with clicks and fear gets clicks. And so they're going to present this in a fearful angle. Consider other possibilities, right? Prioritize your mental health. Anxiety and all these things drive the same symptoms as CTE and concussion and PCS. So if you can get your mental health under control, you can potentially mitigate many of these symptoms. Neuropsychological assessment. If you think something's wrong, if you think you have memory impairments, go and actually see a neuropsychologist because oftentimes in cognitive testing, they'll actually find that no, you don't have any memory impairments. And that might just make you feel better about the situation. So if you are concerned, you can find a neuropsychologist and undergo some testing and see. Stay cognitively and socially active, right? We need to keep our brains active. We need to keep them sharp, neuroplasticity, all of that stuff. We need to be learning new skills and trying new things and doing things we've always done, socializing, laughing, having that um, you know, exercise, all of the stuff you need to be physically, mentally active to keep your brain healthy. And finally, reduce inflammation, okay? If you are concerned about this, no alcohol, okay? Avoid substances, avoid opiate medications, obviously. Uh, eat a very clean diet, okay? Avoid refined sugars, refined carbohydrates. Eat high fat, high protein. Um, s- optimize your sleep, right? There's things you can do to make your sleep like very, very, very good, very efficient. Clearing excess inflammation uh, is important. Regular exercise, all of these things help stabilize blood pressure, stabilize mood, improve um 
um, the clearance of inflammation in your brain reduce the chances of having neurodegenerative conditions. So just because you've had a couple of concussions in your life doesn't mean that it's over for you. You can take the steps right now to prevent this accelerated decline hypothesis. So I'm showing an image on the screen here where you have kind of normal healthy aging in this line that's going down. This is kind of the accelerated decline hypothesis. You then have a situation where you get concussions and you don't really do anything about it and you get systemic inflammatory conditions. You're going to have an accelerated decline hypothesis. But if you take the right steps and you actually have reduced inflammation, improved diet, exercise, all of these things, you can prevent or stave off that accelerated decline uh, over time um, on a hypothetical way. So if you are concerned, you can do the right things. Now, if you are a clinician and you want to learn more about how to manage concussions and learn more how to help your patients with these conditions, help them with rehab, help them with getting back in exercise, help them find the right diet, then check out some of our clinical training programs at completeconcussions.com and uh, we have full courses on all this stuff to try and teach you this stuff so you can help your patients. And if you are a patient and you are concerned and there isn't a clinic in your area or have been struggling with this and you want to know how to clear inflammation, how to eat better, how to uh, focus on your mental health, how to start meditating, how to improve your sleep, how to fix your gut, how to balance your hormones, all of this stuff, go to concussiondoc.io. That's concussiondoc.io. We have a program there called the Concussion Fix and it teaches you and walks you through how to do this stuff. So if you need help, need to get things back on track, I would encourage you to check out those things. If you're a clinician looking for training in this area, check out completeconcussions.com. Now, I will say that that is it. That was a big session on that. I threw a ton of information at you. But the whole purpose here, the whole goal is just to show you that things are not as clear cut as we are led to believe that they are. We are told that concussions cause brain damage, and that's it. And the reality of it is, well, there may be an association. There may not be as strong of an association as it's laid out to be. There may be things you can do about it. There may be other factors at play. It's not necessarily just concussions, but it could be other things that happen in the life of a professional athlete, opioid substances, et cetera, et cetera, that are leading to the symptoms and the neurodegenerative conditions. So no, don't necessarily just take it to be concussion as the be all end all. I think that we still have a ton to learn in this area. So that's it. Hope you liked it. Hope you uh, were able to get through all of that. Um, next week, I'm not even sure what the topic is, but I will be back on Wednesday and I will see you then. So now I will take questions from the Instagram live group. 